Welcome everyone to another installment of Gardens and Grub All Things Food, our second to last installment before we're done for 2021. Uh, we are going to talk for about 20 minutes about this delicious vegetable slash fruit that you have all tasted, I'm sure, before. And then uh, we will open it up for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or ask a question in the chat box or message us on Facebook. So today we are going to talk about tomatoes. Tis the season. Uh, right now, if you're growing these in your garden here in the Piedmont of North Carolina, they are kicking off like nobody's business. If you are growing these in the desert, desert Southwest, um, you probably uh, don't have any tomatoes because it's so hot that they won't pollinate themselves. Um, and then you'll be harvesting all the way through Thanksgiving. Um, we'll be harvesting here through probably the end of September, early October. And then during the first frost, those plants will die back and we'll be putting in things like kale. So tomatoes actually originated what scientists think they origin originated most probably uh, wild varieties of them on the, um, the Western coast of South America. So often when people think of tomatoes, they think of like Italian cuisine, at least in the United States, that's what we think of. Southern, you know, your tomato sandwiches and whatnot, but usually when the people think tomatoes, tomato sauces, marinara, that this would be a uniquely Italian uh, vegetable. And actually it's not, it didn't actually make it over to Italy until about the 1700s. Um, this is actually a uniquely American plant, South American specifically. Um, so when Hernan Cortez in around the 1520s um, discovered the new world, uh, he actually um, found that Aztecs, ancient Aztecs, already were uh, cultivating these plants. So um, uh, cultivating them um, in an area where they would be perennial, meaning they would grow basically year round because there wasn't a lot of frost where they were cultivating these. Um, if you live in a tropical environment, a tomato plant, uh, usually an indeterminate tomato plant, we'll talk about what that means in a minute, um, will usually live about three years. Um, but here in the United States, if we have anywhere where it gets frosty at all, anywhere below you know, 35 degrees, tomatoes are an annual, where that means that we pull them out and we grow them once a year. So we're not having them go year after year after year. Often when people start new gardens, they base their relativity of green thumb on whether or not their tomatoes did well. And I'm here to tell you, tomatoes are the hardest thing to grow, especially out here in the south southeastern United States, where they can be very fickle, they can be very disease prone. Uh, I've heard it described that tomatoes are narcissists. They need everything their way, everything. They put themselves first in all things, and they're picky. They get sick easy. Um, I like to think that um, you know, if you had uh, cliques of, of uh, groups at high schools, um, your cabbage family, your kale family would be like the chill kid that gets along with all the groups of people, whereas your tomato plants would be the snobby, whiny, um, you know, kind of uh, fussy girls who uh, don't get along well with others and have to have everything their way. Everything must be just so, or they will not come to your party. So uh, tomatoes can be very tricky. So if you, if this is your first time growing tomatoes, or you look forward to growing tomatoes someday, please know that they're the hardest thing to grow and that it's much easier to start in the spring or the fall gardening. First of all, it's not as hot outside. Things aren't as disease prone. There's not as many bugs. And most of the stuff that grows from the fall through the spring here in the Piedmont of North Carolina play well with others and are not as disease prone. So um, why don't we go ahead and take a look at the different kinds of uh, tomato plants there are so that you kind of know what to expect when you are shopping for um, plants. Right now it's pretty late in the season to put plants in. So I went ahead and procured this plant. You can tell it's kind of large. Normally you don't buy them when they're this tall and leggy, but this one's been in a pot for a really long time. Um, the way that you would plant these, let me show you really quickly. I don't know if you can see on the screen, the little hairs that are on the stem there. You see those hairs? Um, tomatoes, and this is the only plant like this. You don't do this with any other form of plant. Most other forms of plants, you put them in the ground right to the soil level where they are. But tomatoes actually, when I plant this later on, I'm gonna break off these leaves and I'm gonna plant this all the way up to here, burying it in the ground in the top six inches of the ground. You dig a trench about five inches, four inches deep and plant it this way. 
And every one of those little tiny hairs is gonna make a separate root. Um, and that gives it much more drought tolerance, disease tolerance, um, and just the ability to soak up nutrients so that this plant become, can become very tall and beautiful. So we've all seen those tomato cages at the garden centers. There's the small tomato cages, medium tomato cages, and large tomato cages. Those are for determinant tomatoes. This is an indeterminate tomato. So indeterminate means vine, or you cannot determine how big it's gonna get. That means it's gonna grow and grow and grow and grow 10 feet up to 10, sometimes 12 feet tall with really strong plants. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to take care of those. You can either uh, stake them so that this central line, you can keep tying up this central line and, uh, and stake them very high. Um, that's one option to do it. There's also a way of putting multiple stakes in, planting them a few feet apart and weaving string in between those stakes. It's called a Florida weave. And as the plants grow up, you kind of weave them in between the strings. You can also espalier these, which means um, growing them on a two-dimensional plane. So you could plant this next to say, like a trellis or um, a chain link fence. And as this grows, you tack up its little arms that come out against that fence. And then these will grow outwards and you'll have kind of like, um, like a shrub that's kind of almost like a privacy fence. So those are all options for indeterminate tomatoes because they grow and grow and grow and grow. You don't know how big they're gonna get and they'll just keep growing until they're not dying but disease, pest or frost. Um, often people don't know that they buy a tomato, they buy a cage and they think this is gonna work if they don't have any experience. Um, so always look on the label. The label will always tell you whether it's a vine type or indeterminate, a bush type, or, an, or a determinant. So let's talk about determinants. Determinants are bush type tomatoes. I don't have one of those there for you here for you today, um, but they only grow probably between three and four, sometimes five feet tall. So those work really well for those tomato cages. You can put one in the ground, put a tomato cage around it, and it will grow in like a nice little tight bush and it will put off all of its tomatoes, all of its flowers at the same time, all of its tomatoes at the same time, and most of the tomatoes will become ripe at the same time. Whereas an indeterminate tomato that gets 10, 12 feet tall, it will flower and fruit at the bottom, and then it'll flower and fruit in the middle, and then it'll flower and fruit at the top. And so an indeterminate is nice for a family at home because you don't need 25 pounds of tomatoes at the same time unless you're really into canning and preserving. Um, indeterminate tomatoes are for things like salad, where you're walking out in the backyard, you're going to grab two or three tomatoes to have with dinner that night, or make a couple of tomato sandwiches for lunch tomorrow, um, you'd go with an indeterminate tomato. Determinant varieties are primarily for people who like to can and preserve tomatoes, or you want a bunch to be able to share with your friends at the same time, or you are an international grocery store who needs tons and tons of tomatoes all at the same time. Um, and how that works is Determinant tomatoes, all the, the tomatoes that you see in the grocery store, generally speaking, you can only get four or five varieties in, in the grocery store, even at a fancy grocery store. And um, those are determinant varieties. They grow on a bush. They're easy to stake. You, only need, you really only need one stake or a, 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 you know, a cage for them. And you can send a crew out into a field and they can harvest all of the tomatoes at the same time. So that's really important if you're trying to produce a bunch of tomatoes, truckloads of tomatoes at the same time. So that's why there's just a few varieties in the grocery store is because they've been chosen to be able to pick, be picked green at a certain point in their development and then boxed, shipped at 55 degrees so they don't continue to ripen and then gassed with ethylene gas so that they um, ripen and look red and then um, survive transport. So that's why tomatoes in the grocery store, although widely available year round, never taste as good as one that you're going to grow in your yard. Because a lot of those heirloom varieties that you're going to be able to grow in your yard um, are not um, good for shipping, shelf life. And that's why they're also like $6 a pound in the grocery store. Um, so just keep that in mind, um, you know, the tomatoes in the grocery store. I never buy tomatoes out of season unless my husband wants to make guacamole and he has to have it, I'll buy a couple of Roma tomatoes. Um, but otherwise I eat so many tomatoes in the summer. If you grow your own garden, you won't buy a lot of things out of season because you'll be so sick of it. 
at the end of the three or four months that it's available that you might have some preserved tomatoes that taste differently, but it comes to a point like with fresh tomatoes, I just can't go any further. And then it's like kale and lettuce season. And I'm so excited to have kale and lettuce and I eat it and eat it and eat it. And then I get sick of it. And then it's, you know, spring again and there's peas and I eat those for a month and then I get kind of sick of that. So seasonal eating is really wonderful because by the time the peas are done and the tomatoes and peppers are going in the ground, I'm craving them again and I eat them every day. So um, let me show you one other type of tomato that now is becoming available on the market um, and is great for containers and pots, uh, apartments, things like that. This is a dwarf tomato and it's one of the smallest dwarf tomatoes you can get. It's called a tiny Tim. And there's a lot of these really small tomatoes that only get at the max two feet tall. And so they grow like a very small determinant, like a little bush, but they put their fruit off and flowers at different times. So these ones are green. These ones have turned red and they're ready to pick and eat. And some of the dwarf tomatoes you can get that get about two feet tall actually grow like medium sized tomatoes. There's a lot of different kinds of dwarf tomatoes that are available on the market today. A lot of times you're going to have to buy seeds and start them yourself. They're not going to put off as much fruit, but they require a lot less maintenance and staking and things like that. So um, just another option for you. So indeterminate means a vine, determinate means a bush and everything can ripe at the same time. And a dwarf is a, is a tiny little mini me. Um, this is just the smallest dwarf that you can get, but they also have some that get like two feet tall and put off all different colors and kinds of fruit. Um, one book, if you're interested in learning about tomatoes here in the South, this is our buddy from NC Tomato Man, Craig LaHoulier wrote this book called Epic Tomatoes. And he uh, works with Seed, Stater, was it was a Seed, Seed Savers Exchange, I think, one of the companies to save seeds um, from different kinds of tomatoes. People have sent him tomato seeds from all over the United States, all over the world, for him to grow them out, test the variety, um, and then add that tomato to the seed bank. Because, you know, we talk a lot about endangered species in the world. Um, you know, there are a lot of them, a lot of animals and plants, but there are so many types of food plants that have gone extinct. Thousands of types of lettuce, thousands of tomatoes have gone extinct because somebody's grandma grew that and got those seeds from her family passed down. And then once the sort of proliferation of a global food system where you can get food all the time and people stopped growing gardens and they became more consumers rather than producers of their own food, a lot of those skills and seed lines have been lost. And so thankfully there's this, um, over the last 20 years, especially resurgence of people wanting to know this knowledge, um, wanting to teach their kids where their food comes from. And then there's been an extreme resurgence of this interest in the last year because of COVID. Um, nothing inspires people to want to learn to be a producer more than walking into the grocery store and not being able to get what you get, what you want when you want it. Uh, that was a really big thing for a lot of people. And so a lot of people have been very much inspired to start gardens, learn how to cultivate food, save seeds, things like that. And I think it's one of the, um, I would say silver linings of the last year and a half of what we've experienced is there's a lot of people that want to know about um, growing and cultivating their own food for their own food security, um, but also for their own sort of control of their, of their future in their life. And I think it's it's a really kind of beautiful thing. So, um, and because I run Briggs Community Garden, we've been able to teach so many more people how to grow food lately because of that. It was also a safe thing for people to be able to do to go outside and be with people, social distance and learn how to grow food. Um, so, um, you know, if you get tomato plants and they fail, don't worry. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to prevent them from being sick. Um, tomatoes are picky and they're pest prone. So you have to give them enough room, you have to give them enough space to dry out. Now, if we're talking about the desert Southwest, you plant them very close together because you're trying to retain as much moisture as possible. But in the South, Southeast where it is wet and um, moldy and funky, um, you want to try to let the air blow through the plants as much as possible. So you need to give them a few feet of space if they're indeterminate. And let me show you how to sucker tomatoes. So it's kind of hard to tell on the camera, but this is a node where, so you can see here where here's the main stem of the plant and there's one that has grown out here. This is just a branch of this main stem, but tomatoes have the ability to, when they, here's the main stem and here's the first stem that came out, you'll see there's a third one that popped out of the middle. This would need to be broken off 
once the plant gets a little bit older, once I put it in the ground. I make it a habit to just go out and yank these off and it does a few different things. It allows air to blow through the plant easier. If you are staking your plants, it allows you to use one central stem and then these branches get stronger and put off a lot of fruit. Um, and then also you can pluck these off and stick them in water and they will root and you get a whole new plant. So um, it's very uh, necessary to do in the South. Some people skip it and they still get good tomatoes. That's perfectly fine. It's brutal outside this time of year. You know, you going out and preening over your tomatoes may not be your way. You may just want to throw them in the ground and see if they survive. Often in the summer times, that's what I do in my own home garden because I'm so busy feeding people out of the community garden that, you know, I'm like the shoemaker's kids running around barefoot because the, the backyard is just, it's a beautiful mess all summer long and I just harvest and then I make sure that my work garden is beautiful and photo ready at all times. Um, and then in the fall and spring, I love being in my own garden because it's gorgeous out. It's beautiful and wonderful. Um, so, so that's an indeterminate tomato plant and our little dwarf. Real quick, while we have a little bit of time left, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about real quick pollination. So your tomato plants will put off little self-pollinating flowers. Bees are not gonna visit them and pollinate them unless they're like a bumblebee flying through. If you've heard of bumblebee, they sound, they're like bigger and they're, and they've got this vibration in the air around them. All flying insects do, but you can actually hear like a honeybee is, it's really high. Um, a, one of those bigger like carpenter bees or bumblebees um, have a lower kind of lumbering and they, fly by and it will actually, the shaking of that air around the tomato um, uh, buds will actually pollinate them. But you can um, mimic this by taking the head off of an electric toothbrush and waving that around your plants, or you just go out first thing in the morning before it reaches 90 degrees or 85 degrees and you just shake the plant, just a little shake, shake. Or you can tap the blossoms because they're self-pollinating. They have all the parts they need to make a tomato, you just need to tap them so that the pollen falls down and pollinates the plant, um, pollinates that particular flower. But do it first thing in the morning and it's really hot outside because if you don't, the pollen will become sterile above 85 or 90 degrees. So for those of you in hotter climes, especially like in the Southwest as well, this is a trick that you can do because you can start putting your tomatoes in the ground in February and have them go all the way through November. But in the summer is where you have no fruit set for a long time because the temperatures are 90 degrees at five o'clock in the morning. So you can go out at night when it's 70, give your plant a little shake and they'll pollinate. But often the, the flowers are open in the morning. So if you can get out there early enough in the morning, you can make it happen and still get a crop in the summertime. Um, okay, so I have a lot of different kinds of tomatoes here that I harvested this morning at Briggs Community Garden, um, but let's talk about a few types. So these are cherries, Ooh, cherry type tomatoes. Um, I really wanted to show you this one. It's a black cherry tomato. It's got this green mixed with the red and it creates this kind of purpling, which is really beautiful. Um, this is a super sweet 100, uh, really common cherry type, very, very tasty. And this one is a sun gold. So it's really ripe because it's orange, but often when these first start to ripen, they're a beautiful yellow color. If you ever get a chance to do uh, sun gold or sun sugar or there's sunset bumblebee, any of those with sun in it, they tend to be really, really sweet. If you don't have as much sun in your yard, you really do need a minimum of six hours of sun a day. But if you're trying to push it and you only have four or five hours of sun a day, grow a cherry tomato because cherry tomatoes, they don't require as much light to create this as you do to create this because um, you need a lot of light to create a fruit. Technically, this is botanically a berry. It is a fruit, it is not a vegetable. It is not the vegetative part of the plant. This is the vegetative part of the plant. This is the fruit of the vine. So it is a fruit, but there's a whole USDA political reason why we call it a vegetable. It had to do with tariffs in the 1800s. We're not gonna go into it here. But um, anyway, so those are cherry types. Um, there's also grape types that are a little bit longer. There, there's like a brand name called Cherubs in the grocery store. That's just one of the brand names of many types of you know these kind of grape tomatoes. One is not better than another. They're all delicious when they're little like that. Um, I wanted to show you this. This is a better boy that has cat facing. So look at that. That happens when there's incomplete pollination, maybe like the the blossom got shook and then it, it only pollinated half of it half of the fruit and then the other half it got too hot and didn't pollinate and you get this funkylicious cat facing 
Um, here's another cool one. This is a pineapple tomato. It's a large slicer. These get to like be a pound and a half. This one's actually relatively small, um, but it's the biggest tomato I think I have here today besides this guy. I think this is a better boy that has some cat facing. I'm not sure. Even though it's incomplete pollination, I think they look so gorgeous like this. Um, but yeah, this is a pineapple tomato. It's tart and sweet. Um, wonderful slicer for a uh, um, for a, a tomato sandwich. I never had a tomato sandwich before I moved to the Southeast because I always tended to grow like kind of smaller tomatoes. Um, and they just aren't a thing in, in the Southwest or the Northwest. Um, I don't even know if in the Northeast, I never even heard of it, but the Southeast, everybody knows a tomato sandwich. Duke mayo with uh, tomatoes on toasty bread. Um, and even when I lived in the Southwest, I never really ate BLTs. I didn't think they were that great. Um, but once I started to live in the Southeast and I can grow these huge tomatoes like this, I've probably had 15 BLTs in the last two weeks. It's been amazing. <laughs> so, um, so these are big slicers. And then I want to show you the other types of tomatoes. Like these are like a medium size. This is a, um, lemon boy, and this is a golden Jubilee. So these are like a medium size slicer. So these are also really great for sandwiches and things. I love different colors of tomatoes. I think they're beautiful. They look gorgeous in a salad. Tomatoes are always good when they're homegrown, but when you have different colors, it looks more beautiful and impressive, I think. Um, and then uh, these are paste type tomatoes. So this is like a Roma type or a paste type. That means that on the inside, it's mostly flesh and there's not a lot of juice and seeds. So the reason they call these paste tomatoes or cooking tomatoes is that if you cook a big slicer like this, you're gonna have a ton of water come off of it. You can still cook this, it's still good. Um, it's just that you're gonna have a lot of liquid because this is mainly, it has a lot more moisture in it and um, seed pods than these guys do. These are more fleshy, um, but but again, you can slice these and have these on a sandwich too. So they're interchangeable. But if you might like making your own tomato sauce or your own salsa, or you want to roast tomatoes to freeze them, um, the, the sauce tomatoes or paste tomatoes are a preferred type for that because they just cook so much faster. You don't have so much juice coming off of them and, um, and they're lovely and concentrated in flavor. So this one's an Amish paste. And I think this one is a San Marzano. So um so yeah well let's see what are we how are we doing on time oh we're running out of time we have seven minutes left does anybody have any questions we do so the first question we have coming in is does the epic tomatoes book have ideas for recipes and preservation you know um <laughs> <laughs> it's mainly about growing and types um if you are going to and diseases and things um yeah, he doesn't, he does have a few preservations, like a really small, like five page section of it. Um, if you're looking to preserve tomatoes, especially if you're canning them, um, go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation. They've got a whole section on it. And also on that site, they have a guide called, if you put in National Center for Home Food Preservation, USDA canning guide, you put that in your search bar, it will actually bring up a PDF that you can print. It's a free guide that they update every year um, where you can learn everything that you would want to can or preserve. Um, and um, they actually teach you to also how to pressure can tomatoes there as well. I just had a question about that recently, how to pressure can tomatoes. And that was a great resource. Um, and they're just, they're scientific. I don't pull a, a recipe out of your grandmother's, uh, you know, um, book and say, okay, she did this 50 years ago and she was fine. I'm gonna water bath can these for 12 minutes. Go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, follow their recipes. And if you needed to augment those at all, give me a call because you don't wanna change the pH. Um, so that's, you know, that is what I would do for that if you're looking specifically to can, dry or freeze. But if you're wanting to roast or do some other interesting things, preserve, you know, sometimes these little sun golds, people would dehydrate them and store them in salt. So they have tomato salt. There's a lot of different ways to preserve them. My preferred method is to roast them till they're like tomato candy, pack them in oil and freeze them because they're a ready-made edible product that, um, you know, I don't really can tomatoes much because I can buy a massive can of tomatoes for $2. Like, so I don't can tomatoes a lot, but I know how to do it. And if people desire to do it, I can show you how to do it. Awesome. Then um, where do tomatillos fit into this story? Okay, so tomatillos, they are in the Solanaceae family, which is what tomatoes, potatoes, tobacco, and nightshades uh, and peppers are in. 
Um, so tomatillos are in the same family, um, but they're adjacent. So they come with like a husk on the outside. Um, they have kind of this almost like umbrella foliage. They're closer to gooseberries than they are tomatoes, um, but they are in the same family. Um, they, um, they're, they're also a fruit. They have kind of a different seed structure on the inside. Um, if you are gonna grow tomatillos, grow two. Make sure, because the tomatillo always needs a pollinator. A lot of times people grow one tomatillo plant and they don't get any tomatillos on it. Um, so my favorite way to preserve those is to also roast them and make them into salsas, uh, cream of tomatillo soup with poblanos, um, stuff like that. So that's kind of where they fit in is they're like tomato adjacent, a cousin. <laughs> Wish I could have some of that soup right now. <laughs> um, so the next question is, if you're a new gardener, what's the easiest tomato plant to start growing with? I would say probably if you're brand new and you have not grown in ground or had your soil tested or amended anything, grow one in a pot. Grow a dwarf or a determinant in a pot with one of those little cages. Um, just get yourself like a bulletproof variety um, like aroma type or something like that. Um, just look on the tag and make sure it says D or determinant and put one of those in the ground uh, just because dwarfs are hard to find. Um, but dwarfs are also very easy. Make sure it has plenty of sunlight and just put your eyes on it every day. You don't have to like fuss over it. Um, let it dry out in between waterings. Um, but I would probably start there as like a container where you can have your eyes on it rather than out on the back 40 and it's hundred degrees outside. Um, that's what I would recommend to get yourself started because you have more of a controlled environment if you have like a potting soil that can feed for six months. Um, that's probably where I would go first where you starting out so you can get like enjoy them. You won't necessarily have like deer attack them if they're on your front porch, um, things like that. Yeah. Awesome. We have another great question. So if I started an indeterminate tomato plant with a cage like a newbie, what should I do to correct that? You put a stake right in the middle of the cage, like depending on how big it is. If it's a huge plant, don't put the stake right next to it because you'll stab its roots, but maybe a little bit off and then train it up the stake and then pull the suckers off. That's what I would do. And then next year you can just do that. Otherwise it's just gonna grow out of that little cage. It'll be laughing at you. It like grows out of the cage and along the ground and they all get attacked by those roly polies or pill bugs or whatever they call them in the South. Um, but yeah, that often happens, but it's okay. I mean, nobody at the Lowe's is gonna stop you. You know, they just tell you to get a bigger tomato cage. And for an indeterminate plant, those big tomato cages are never enough. So, <laughs> yes, indeed. I've also I've also done that. So don't worry for our newbies. It's very here. common. You're not the only one. <laughs> so before we started, we were talking a little bit about what happened to my tomato plants because of too much rain and humidity. And I was wondering if you could give us all just kind of an overview of all what's going on in our gardens. Thanks to all of this rain and humidity we've been having. We'll probably be seeing your tomatoes starting to crash and burn. That's what we call it when... Um, they don't get enough air, they get really wet, and especially growing tomatoes in the same place every year, anything in the Solanaceae family, tomato, potato, pepper, uh, tomatillo, tom you know, tobacco, not that anybody's growing tobacco in their garden, but if you grow those same plants all the time, the diseases grow, grow up in the soil, so bacterial blights, fungal blights, those grow in the soil, and if it gets really wet, and especially if the water splashes on the underside leaves, and you start to get yellow leaves and you don't get out there and rip those leaves off right now, then they, then it'll just spread. Um, I, I, you know, I'm in a community garden and you'll get one sick plant and the wind will blow and just contaminate. I mean, you can even see plants that are next to each other. One will turn yellow and then this side of the other one will turn yellow. That's not a, you know, mistake. That's, that's nature because there are things that enjoy eating tomato plants. So the ways that you can prevent that are cycling through and planting in different areas. If you're going to put in a garden bed, put in three, if you can, three smaller beds or one long bed that you separate into three sides so that you cycle through as much as possible. Um, don't plant, you know, tomatoes and peppers in the same soil that you did before. Give it two or three years so that they can cycle through and then make sure to plant your plants far enough away so that air can dry. Um, pull off any brown leaves on the bottom, mulch underneath them with like straw is okay, but 
leaves are the best. If you can keep yourself like a bag of leaves or even a pile of leaves, often in the fall, I blow all of the oak leaves into my little garden area, mulch everything. And by next summer, they're all broken down into little chunky pieces. That's perfect because then if it rains, you don't have bacteria, soil bacteria splashing up on the bottom leaves. But as soon as you put your plant in and the plant grows up a little bit, cause these are gonna be in contact with the ground. As soon as I get more foliage up here, I just automatically rip off the ones that are close to the ground because they're in contact with the soil. And no matter what in our moist environment, you're gonna have, you're gonna have that. So they're very finicky, they, they're not disease resistant and they, they fall apart sometimes, but it's okay. Rip that one out, pop another one in and you could get like a late harvest and then next year plant in another area. And can that disease spread to other plants that are not tomatoes in my garden? Uh, it depends on what it is. So it, it really does depend on what it is. Um, usually just, just the Solanaceae family primarily gets those kinds of blights. Um, it is possible in other things, but you've got problems with other things like squash get downy mildew when this happens. They get squash bugs. They get, you know, vine borers. They have their own problems. I would say tomatoes then squash are the most finicky. And um, well, not the plant, squash plants aren't finicky, but they get attacked by a lot of stuff. So you gotta be on top of them all the time, pulling off bugs and things. So, um, yeah, if you want to grow something that's not a lot of trouble, uh, I would probably go with an eggplant. Eggplants, even though they're in that same family, you'll get a flea beetle on the leaves. It looks like a shotgun pattern on your leaves. They don't touch the fruit. It's not a sweet fruit, so nothing really wants it. And <laughs> that's a problem is humans don't want it that bad either most of the time, not as bad as they want a tomato. Um, but an eggplant's real easy to do. You throw that bad, bad boy in there, set it and forget it. They don't hardly get bothered by anything so <laughs> awesome Sherilyn well I am feeling a sadness that we only have one more of these shows because this is all such great info but um we are again out of time I'm sure not out of questions but out of time so we will close it up for the week okay we'll see you next week everybody for our last gardens and grub thank you bye-bye